So when I uh, told my boss I wanted to do this conference, I wanted to do it at the, the DC Culture House. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. It's very colorful. And we decided to do it here at the National Press Club instead. But Chris here definitely would have fit in well at the DC Culture House. Nailed it. Uh, best dressed of the day. Look at those shoes. So um, I left the DoD uh, after five years um, helping run some of the largest AI and autonomy programs at Project Maven and the Joint AI Center. Um, they don't typically, you know, my handlers, that some of whom are here on the stage earlier or out in the audience, you guys know who you are, they didn't typically let me um, talk in public. They, they kept me chained in a cave in the back actually working on the systems and making sure everything works. But I got the chance to observe, you know, multiple panels like this. And a lot of times, you know, on the industry panel, it's like the kind of the usual suspects of traditional defense contractors. And in this case, I think we're, you know, we've got a unique opportunity to talk to really a full spectrum of um, industry performers here, some of whom, like Apexa on the, on the line from Gaddick, uh, the, the co-founder and chief engineer, work only in autonomous trucking in the in the commercial space um, you know we've got ryan Seng here from uh, co-founder and ceo of shield ai they are kind of a dual use uh, vc backed startup that does defense and commercial um, reagan from l3 harris the the gm of autonomous and advanced naval platforms definitely a major player in the prime space and then uh, chris lynch co-founder and ceo of rebellion which is a defense um, you know, software company that is primarily focused on defense, working a number of um, autonomy programs in the DOD. So I think we're, we're going to try and tease out uh, you know, what is real, like what is hype, um, and how the department can learn from some of the commercial best practices. We might get a little more technical on this panel than some of the previous panels, but I think we'll, we'll keep it at a high level. Um, and we're really going to try and see you know, how can the department learn from what's gone on in the last you know, five to 10 years in the commercial space in order to transition some of these autonomy programs that are in R&D now to uh, you know, fielding and sustainment in the future. Um, before I, I start, I'm gonna kind of set a, a framework here on what is the difference between commercial and defense autonomy, which is the subject of the panel today. So I've been on both sides of the fence now. I spent a long time in the DoD running um, autonomy programs and now I'm here in industry. Applied intuition, like we talked about at the beginning of the day, is primarily focused on the commercial sector, um, but we're growing in the defense space. And I, I, you know, when people ask me, like, what's the difference between commercial and defense autonomy, I, I kind of set it up this way. So the general concept of commercial autonomy is to move something from point A to point B, where point B is typically a known point. You're dropping off a person or a package or delivering a pizza. Um, and you know, the, the hard part there is a mobility problem. It's keeping things on the road, stopping at stop signs, not hitting a pedestrian. Um, on the defense side, you know, you have that problem as well, but it's less of a mobility issue and you have like a higher level reasoning. So on the defense side, uh, typically point B is not a known point. You're putting an aircraft in an orbit or you're putting a vehicle on a route to optimize, you know, longer range sensors, not your mobility sensors, but your longer range sensors to detect and classify a, uh, you know, a threat, basically, out of the myriad of other things that are out there. And then also trying to keep that, that vehicle out of the threat ring of other of bad guy stuff. Um, and so that kind of higher level reasoning is really where um, I've seen the applied engineers and, and others in this space that are, that are here today focusing. Um, so, how, so the way I look at it is, you know, my hypothesis is that the, the kind of foundational development pipeline is very similar for both problems. I think that's what we're going to try and tease out here today. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to start by going out to Apexa in virtual land. Um, you know, at Gaddick, you've got uh, trucks driving on the road right now, unmanned and with safety drivers. Very curious on your um, kind of current assessment of the state of autonomy in the commercial space, what you know well. Um, and then maybe you could talk to us a little bit about like what a well-designed development pipeline looks like for autonomy software. So over to you. Thank you, Carl Colin. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that great 
introduction and laying out the land. Um, I would start with a quick round of introduction. I'm a patient, I'm one of the co-founders and chief engineer at Gothic. Uh, at Gothic, what we have been up to is uh, building these autonomous box trucks specifically for middle mile B2B short haul use case. What this means is these vehicles are purpose built for delivering goods. Um, between known locations. So uh, something that Colin pointed out, uh, even within the commercial space, there are different kinds of, uh, I would say, use cases and applications uh, and a whole spectrum of uh, point A and point B, whether it's known or it's dynamic. Uh, for our use case, both the starting point, point A and point B, are essentially known and fixed. Uh, these are something like warehouses, distribution centers, retail fronts. Uh, for our customers like Walmart, Low Gloss, and many others, for whom we have been deployed in commercial capacity for past several years, uh, doing multiple trips seven days a week. Uh, one of the key milestones that we achieved uh, last year with Walmart uh, was going fully driverless, uh, no one in the driver's seat uh, on these delivery routes uh, in Arkansas. Uh, beyond this, we are also deployed across several different states, uh, including Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, uh, as well as Greater Toronto area in Canada. Um, from here on, this, what we are essentially up to is expanding uh, with new and old customers, uh, both in scale in the number of vehicles and fleet size, uh, as well as uh, in terms of geographies and uh, states that we are essentially operating in. I think uh, looking at it more from an um, uh, I would say uh, operations standpoint, as well as like what does a well-defined process uh, looks like. I think uh, one of the key enablers for us uh, in achieving uh, these critical milestones, as well as uh, successful deployments across the different customer sites, um, have has been our extreme focus on structured autonomy. Uh, and when I say structured autonomy, it's the known routes or known locations where the vehicles start and where the vehicles end at. Uh, it has been a very key enabler in terms of achieving these milestones in this kind of like time frame. Uh, the other key aspect of it is our, uh, I would say more organized hybrid um, agile approach, as I say, towards uh, building systems and safety throughout the development and deployment processes at our operations. So instead of thinking about it more from a more purely waterfall approach or a purely agile approach, um, I think it's um, uh, it's something hybrid version of like having multiple smaller Bs, B processes uh, with tighter and quicker feedback cycles between the requirements for the products, testing, verification, validation, fuel the fuel the uh, overall uh, development and deployment process. I think uh, there are several aspects of it, um, and there have been a lot of a lot of these items. I think we have been working very closely uh, with our partner, like Applied, uh, in terms of uh, evolving and adopting this. A lot of these include such as like. I would say targeted data collection and triaging from the field. Um, there are certain like, uh, I would say high fidelity simulations, both for software in loop as well as hardware in loop. Um, there are certain aspects of re-simulation for the data captured in the real world and changing certain parameters and experimenting with it, um, as well as a very exhaustive scenario testing with fault injections uh, on closed ports, test tracks, um, where we essentially test these vehicles before we roll these out uh, in operations on public road. So, um, in my perspective, I would the way I see it is a lot of these processes, tools, and standards. Uh, if we look back a couple of years, um, did not exist for the level of automation or scale uh, of operations. Um, I think the one of the key strategies uh, that we have employed at Kadek from the very, very early very, very early stages of the company is um, partner partnering with um, industry leaders such as Applied who share our vision in terms of these kinds of innovations um, to create as well as adopt these processes to at the end of the day deliver on the safety efficiency and cost savings that we are promising our customers. So I would say that's the overall um, uh, from an from an operations standpoint and from the uh, autonomy program standpoint, those are some of the building blocks that uh, we think were key enablers for us. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like uh, a key kind of part of your strategy is 
you're you're choosing a manageable bite-sized piece to chew to, to bite off first and going after that yeah. and then i'm sure that's on your roadmap to expand out i mean ryan i i know you guys have been uh doing this now for quite some time uh can you talk about maybe how you started you know four or five years ago and where you are now and then what you see as the future in unmanned and autonomous from your perspective yeah, sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ryan Sang. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Shield AI. Shield AI exists to advance security and stability by building the world's best AI pilot. The company's been around for about seven years now. Uh, it was founded in 2015. My brother was a Navy SEAL. He was getting ready to transition, and I had been a technology founder that sold the company to Qualcomm, and so he came to me and felt like there was a great opportunity to bring the best in technology to the mission of national security. I felt like it was a great mission. Uh, it was something that I wanted to support, but I also felt like it was a really terrible business idea because conventional wisdom for so long had been that you never start a venture-backed company that's gonna go after defense. But my brother, uh, you know, the trait that made him a SEAL, among others, is that he's a very persistent person, and so, he eventually wore me down. I agreed to, to join the company, and we, we started the company uh, with the mission of protecting service members and civilians with artificially intelligent systems. It took us a while to get people to uh, uh, believe that there might be an opening for success, uh, but fast forward to today, we've got about 400 people. Uh, I think uh, measured across many dimensions, we, we, we have what I think some would argue is the world's best AI pilot. And when we think about bringing the capability from the drawing board to the real world. Uh, some of the themes that were expressed uh, j just a second ago are, are things that we think about, which is how do you break down the problem into smaller pieces? How do you find a way to have um, a sustainable business model because you're going after things that can generate value early and often? How can you find ways to do deployments so you're actually closing the feedback loop between the development and the real world, which is something that's so important. I think one of the major lessons in autonomy has come from Tesla, a company which I think most people are familiar with. And I would say the thing that they have succeeded at doing where others have really struggled is to, number one, find a sustainable business model for autonomy. By leveraging the driver in the car, they were able to push out technology to a much lower level of maturity. And then number two, they, and, and therefore monetize it. And then number two, they found ways to optimize cycle time. And so uh, many people here are probably from defense who use the term OODA, but that's just, uh, that is equally relevant to engineering. If you can find ways to get your capability deployed, your engineers can conceive, develop, and test much faster, which makes them a much more effective team. And so when we think about taking something from conception to reality, uh, we think about the principles of uh, a sustainable business and the ability to have very fast cycle times. Chris, I'm gonna throw it over to you. Uh, having worked on some of the, the DOD's autonomy programs now and then being, having been in the DOD, do you, uh, I guess, what do you see as the DOD's kind of biggest struggle to, to get to what Ryan and, and Apexo were saying? Sure. Hey, everybody. Chris Lynch. Um, <clears throat> I also am part of a group that decided to start a company focused exclusively on defense and national security, which is very very hard and, and how do we and think modeling about sunglasses on your head yeah well that's the, because of the the the, the bright burn um, the there's a couple of things that I think about so going back to just the list that you were laying out and kind of how to think about the current programs and what's happening because um, we're in a piece of this so what do we build we build Products that help with um, perception, understanding of battle space, threats, things like that. So this is going to be how do we use computers to uh, analyze uh, sensor data and tell us where there are threats in an environment. And actually, Colin, you kind of started on that, right? D differentiating between commercial and military. Uh, we build things to connect platforms. Uh, as it turns out, the DoD is very, very large, and you know it's what, a three million person organization, right? That includes military and civilians. So that's a lot of people who are doing a lot of things. That doesn't really even include contractors. So, you know, it's always helpful to think about any solution where somebody's like, oh, you know what the military should just do? They should just do this. You have to remember that it's like kind of a, it's like either a really large city or a, or a small country at any given moment. So um, anything that, you know, that you're gonna change actually takes a little bit of work. Um, and then, you know, I, I think of this last little bit here, which is that 
when we think about what's happening and what we're building, we're also thinking about how do we secure this because software and technology is going to ultimately define advantage uh, in the battlefield, right? And we think about sort of where things have come from. You think of big, heavy machines that are sitting out a, on a runway or floating in the ocean. We think about those, but software and what we're talking about here today are ultimately going to provide key advantages, right? And if we can understand what the battle space is and we have information advantage, then we can lead to decision advantage. So we think a lot about how do we secure those things and provide both information decision advantage. Now, all that being said, uh, when you talk about, let's talk about different things that are going on in the department, what does it actually look like? Well, it, what I, there's good and there's not so good, right? There's good and there's bad here. Um, when you look at what's actually happening in the department, there's an unbelievable desire to lead on all of these technologies, everything that we're talking about here. I can't go through a meeting with the, the Department of Defense or the, the uh, intelligence community without somebody bringing up any one of these technologies, AI, autonomy, computer vision. I can't go through a single meeting where people are not bringing those things up. What we're seeing, however, is that there's a lot of things that are fundamentally missing, right? Some of the things, actually, I was going to say, I have a different way to look at commercial versus military, and it's a little bit more pragmatic. What are some of the things that are missing that are just given that anybody who's starting a company and commercial is going to be thinking about? Well, you're probably going to be like, hey, we can go ahead and drop a bunch of this data into a commercial cloud environment. We can run a bunch of things, build out our models, and then easily redeploy that, and we have instant connectivity to all of our things. You brought up Tesla. Well, they got you know, LTE or 5G that's available in cars. Well, what if you don't have any of those things? Well, that's a little bit harder, right? So in the military, because of the, the fact that it's very fragmented, a lot of those things are missing, right? So you don't have the ubiquitous compute connectivity, and you don't necessarily have the ubiquitous amount of storage. So some of that, that is going to be missing. So that's a challenge. And I think a lot of the groups that are early adopters are trying to push forward the the idea of how we do this in a, in, a, in a way that's at scale, I think that you're gonna find that those, those groups are running into substantial challenges. How do we deploy this stuff, right? And oh, by the way, the Department of Defense is really good at buying big, heavy, industrial things, right? Well, what does it mean when it's software? Like, how does that work? What if that wasn't the thing that you cared about 30 years ago, but we're really good at buying a new tank? But we wanna use all these technologies. So, you know, there's a lot of like, well, does it, is a tank that uses artificial intelligence and autonomy, if we delivered that tomorrow, what happens if those models need to be updated, right? Going back to your Tesla example, what if the models are wrong and you need to actually, you know, do something different? How do you deploy that? How does that get out to the battlefield? How does it get out, out to a place where there's no connectivity? These are real challenges. So all these things have to be solved in lockstep. You can't just ignore them. Right? So not only do we have to be able to have some place to like figure out what we're doing and what we're training models against, then we have to figure out like, cool, how to buy that stuff, and we tend to be really good at buying the big heavy metal things, and then we also have to deploy it. So uh, not, those are all substantial challenges. So, you know, it, it's a lot of hard work, and it's being done in pieces. But again, it's like it's a, it's a small country of people who are trying to make this happen, and it's gonna take some time. It's not gonna just happen because, you know, one company or one group is working on it. And I'm sure you saw the same thing. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that, <laughs> definitely. So, so Reagan, having um, been a PM in the Department of the Navy, and having heard kind of Chris lay out, here's some of the, the issues, um, how, do you, how do you kind of view is it the PM's role to then kind of own that whole thing? Like I'm making a, a you know autonomous unmanned service vessel. Do I need to own the 5G connectivity out to the, to the vessel as well? Or like where does the PM's role end? Yeah, interesting question. So hi everyone, Regan Campbell. I am uh, currently the general manager for autonomous and advanced naval platforms. As uh, just alluded to, I previously was a uh, program manager on the Navy side for the next frigate program, so Constellation class, for those of you who enjoy uh, uh, Navy work. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting question in terms of what is the PM's responsibility. So, so a lot of the things that we're talking about that, that these folks are working on, and, and really even some of my own team are working on, are the 
science and technology, the research and development, the OTA type work, right? That future work that isn't necessarily ready for a program of record. Um, of course, as you start to get into the PM's role in bringing technology forward into a program of record, you face a number of challenges, right? How are we going to bridge that gap? What's the right technology? You know, are you going through all the acquisition processes, which, yes, can be um, lengthy and challenging, but it's how we buy things. Um, so we have to help navigate, um, both from an industry side and from, uh, really from, you know, in my case, Navy, on the fleet side, right? We have to be pulling that technology, setting the requirement, drawing in the acquisition community as well. So there are a number of things that we can do to help that. Uh, as a PM, right, engaging with the fleet, understanding what the need is, engaging uh, with industry and understanding what industry knows. I think there is a, um, particularly in this space, there is a desire by the Department of Defense to try to own it and, and be the, the font of knowledge, um, but really they don't fully understand what um, AI companies can bring to the table. They don't understand how mature the technology is, and they don't understand all the use cases or, or capabilities that we can bring to bear for their problems. So the PM has to be willing to reach out and understand exactly the maturity levels that are out there, the potential, and then really be willing to work with um, with the fleet to understand how they could use this technology, right? It has to be a it has to be a conversation. It has to be a learning environment. And it has to be um, a transition, but also a what are the future capabilities that we're going to bring to bear? So, for instance, in in my world, right, I build autonomous surface vehicles. So there's a near-term mission set that we're headed after. But there are so many more missions that it's capable of. Uh, as you start introducing, for instance, autonomous payloads, you start growing the capability, the fleet gets their hands on it, they start to realize there are different things it can do. Um, the, the PM has to, has to have a transition path for future technologies built into a life cycle plan. So a lot of, a lot of exciting stuff there. We'll follow up on that in a second. Ryan, go ahead. Can I comment? So, so there are a lot of discussions um, and, and great points made about what government could do differently to acquire, you know, AI and software. But kind of in, in my journey, I've, I've arrived at kind of a simple thing that I've known for a long time, which is, you know, accountability matters. Find a way to win. A company is accountable for its survival. A company is accountable for its success. And I don't think anybody in industry should be planning on the government changing. For, for the first five years, I attended so many conferences, and I had high hopes that the government would suddenly change and figure out how to buy software. And a couple of years ago, I decided that that just wasn't going to happen. But that doesn't mean that we can't find a way to get the best software and best AI in the hands of government customers. You just have to hold yourself accountable as a business, and you have to hold yourself as accountable as a team and a person to find a way to win. I was having a conversation with my executive team a couple of years ago on this very topic. And I said, look, here, here are our choices. Either we don't like the rules, we're going to create a new system, we're going to set up the XFL, or we're going to accept the rules as they are, and we're going to build the New England Patriots, and we're going to be the best damn AI provider the government or the world has ever seen, and we're going to figure it out. And so that's where Shield AI is at this point, and I would advise anybody that's thinking about starting a company that wants to transact with government. And, and I have great optimism that the government will change and find ways to, to acquire software more easily, but that cannot be part of your business plan if you want to find success in this market. Yeah, so we, there were multiple panels earlier. And so I, like, a lot of times when you get industry on a panel, it's just like a, it's a bitch fest, right? Everyone's complaining. <laughs> Deputy Hicks was no out. No excuses. <laughs> Deputy Hicks was out in Silicon Valley. They had like an industry day, 17 companies. This was about a month ago. And it was just continuous bombardment on her from everyone complaining about how they don't know how to work with DoD. So I, I tend to agree with you. However, you've got your brother who was a, a, you know, in the DoD, speaks the language. We all kind of have some DoD background here. There are lots of companies that don't. 
I, um, I think that, I mean, that's the key thing, though, right? It's not just my brother who, who you know, enables us to, to find ways to get our software in the hands of the right people. We have an entire organization set up to transact with government because we recognize the complexity of the programs, we recognize the knowledge gap, and we recognize that if we want to be the tip of the spear driving new technology, you know, again, we have to hold ourselves accountable for finding a way to speak the language of the customer, to transact in a way that the customer understands. And of course, I'm happy to participate in panels like this and enumerate, you know, maybe in a sidebar, all the things that could be done differently that would make our life easier. But challenge also creates opportunity, right? And, and when you're competing in business, which I think is a good thing in general because it drives forward technology, it drives forward capability, um, when you're competing in business, you just can't afford to wait. I mean, and, and, and when you are up against a hard challenge, whether it be the technology challenge of AI or the procurement challenges of government, it creates opportunity. It means that countless others are going to slam into the wall and fail. And if you're durable enough, gritty enough, and clever enough, you're going to find that hole in the wall and everybody else is going to bounce off. I have maybe somewhat moving to a to a slightly different uh, direction on this, which is you brought up the the maturity of the technology, and and I'll actually call out a few other things. Um, I do agree that you have to go to where you see the easiest way to uh, to play a part in a role in the military and the business. I I say this a lot, and I think that it's important. You, you can't just be enamored with the complexity and the difficulty of the problem ahead. However, I do think that for those of us who are in this space and are there, in our building, one of the, the comments that, uh, that you had that kind of made me think about it was the maturity of the technology. I actually think if I'm in the Department of Defense and I'm thinking about these technologies and where to go, I actually wouldn't get too caught up in the fantastical uses of artificial intelligence and machine learning and computer vision. And, you know, I kind of laid out a few steps that I hope that is... That, that people in the department, I and mean, I know that people in the department are working through, right? Getting ubiquitous compute and storage, having an ability to deploy software, having an ability to update things. Those are all gonna be, they're gonna be key, especially if we're gonna have conflict with technologically advanced adversaries, right? Um, but one of the things that I think that people actually get, get lost in is, I have a lot of discussions where I just wanna get people level set to where things are. My entire house is run from a whole series of smart assistants and technologies and everything's automated and is great when it works. Most of the time I ask for the damn lights to be turned on and they don't turn on and I ask for my coffee machine to be turned on at a certain time and it doesn't and half the lights will not ever be triggered by the automations that are working. And this is with everything being 100% state of the art. So I actually find that I'm kind of not enamored with the current state when we think about the fantastic uses of how all these things might do or might be used. And I think that that's actually very helpful, right? The reality is, is that when we talk about self-driving cars and we talk about Tesla and going back down to it, let's not kid ourselves. There's not a bunch of Teslas that are driving around them streets autonomously doing everything 100% by themselves. And when you look at the Gaddick example, that's a really good example. We understand where we're going. We have a lot of knowns in order to make that happen. The military deals a lot in unknowns. The difference is that we might actually set something as a destination and it might not exist when we get there. I think that that's important. That's a huge difference. It might actually be gone. We're seeing that happen right now with Russia attacking Ukraine, right? That's the type of stuff that's actually unfolding in front of our eyes. So when we think about this, we should think about, like, let's not actually try to set the examples that it's all the fantastical uses of computer vision, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Let's actually talk about the things that we can do because I find that we spend way too much time talking about all the shit that doesn't actually exist and we want it to exist and we've seen in every science fiction movie and I have every belief in my heart that it is gonna be there at some point in the future and I'm super excited for it because I'm waiting for my coffee machine to turn on when I tell it to and I'm waiting for the lights to be triggered at the right time and to be at the right color and all that kind of stuff, but they're not, right? Now that doesn't mean that it's not useful technology because it absolutely is, right? But let's make sure that we're bringing everybody along on the journey. And so when I think about like uh, the, the talking about building a business and you think about how to participate in the, in the mission of defense and national security, know that it is hard. It is hard. It's just a reality. Don't be caught up in how difficult it is because you still have to build a business. I totally agree with that. 
But on the same end, it is incredibly important, and it needs people like us. It needs people like you. It needs people like me. And it needs others to come into the mission. It needs people like us to help guide and direct and build that path into the future. But they're going to also have to be a good partner. That's just the reality, right? And that's going to be the key thing about how I think about advantage in the future and how software, artificial intelligence, autonomy is going to ultimately play an incredible role in providing those key advantages that I was uh, talking about earlier. Yeah, I'd like to, so I'd like to go back out to Apexha. So, you know, from what Chris said, hey, here's the kind of baseline truth on, on autonomy. You're at the forefront there. Just curious, you've got some experience working in a startup. You've got some experience working at a large automotive manufacturer. It, to me, large automotive manufacturer sounds very much like Department of Defense when I picture them. Um, could you kind of talk about your experiences there and the difference and maybe uh, what you've learned? For sure, Chris, I, uh, Colin, I think uh, one of the things that uh, uh, during this discussion, uh, I think uh, not uh, coming from uh, more of a uh, defense side, but more on the commercial side, like one of the key things that uh, at Gatik that we essentially held very dearly when we started the company uh, and something that I have learned over uh, my previous experiences as well as um, obviously the technology and uh, the state of the art would take some time to mature, but there are some uh, use cases and applications which are very near term and quite achievable, uh, uh, feasible, even from a technology standpoint. Uh, one of the key things that uh, we had in mind and the focus at Gatik uh, of having uh, structured autonomy use case of having these known route use case uh, was essentially to have these some of the unknowns as well as being able to address those unknowns in a more tangible manner right so if we if we look at the overall commercial landscape there is a huge amount of like even in the logistics space there is like a landscape of a spectrum of different use cases all the way from long haul to uh, b2c deliveries going from retail fronts to customer doorsteps right um, what Gatik is uh, focusing on is the middle mile, the uh, uh, B2B, where we're essentially delivering from warehouses, distribution centers to other warehouses. Um, I think uh, uh, there is a need in terms of like, uh, I would say more frontier technology. Uh, and this is what uh, like I believe, uh, very truly believe in is uh, what's possible, what's feasible and finding out those uh, use cases and. Uh, I would say the segments where this technology can be actually useful uh, in terms of like the efficiency as well as safety uh, and a lot of different benefits that can be found in other markets and other segments as well. Uh, but that has been a key learning uh, at, uh, while forming and uh, 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 growing Gatek is um, the focus on uh, tangible use cases that can actually see the light uh, in the commercial space. Um, I think the other aspect, uh, more from more from the OEMs and uh, I would say more well-established organizations. I think the key uh, thing that uh, that that we see uh, across these industries is um, we are still thinking about these solutions. Uh, I would say that these companies are still thinking about the solutions more from the traditional automotive perspective. Uh, a lot of the processes and standards and tools are still uh, aligned to those traditional automotive perspective. Uh, the applications that uh, essentially what Gatik is working on or autonomy of like L3 or L4 plus level autonomy, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting combination of traditional automotive space as well as uh, the more advanced complex software systems including AI and machine learning. Right. So just thinking about uh, these processes uh, and adopting it from one single industry, um, it's, it's not enough. Uh, we, we really need, um, there's a necessity to evolve these processes, adopt these uh, as part of the overall organization uh, from get-go. So I think um, it, it's, it's not just about the safety that we are delivering on, it's also the predictability in the timelines of delivering the solution. Um, is also important. So I think uh, there is there is a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, confusion around the maturity of the technology and uh, its application to the different use cases, um, even in the autonomy space. But I think uh, what 
what we need to realize is there are certain use cases, there are certain applications uh, where this technology is very feasible and can be a, uh, applied um, in the near future, uh, and we should recognize and address those. Yeah, if I could, if I could add it um, along to that. So, absolutely, same experience on the ASV side of the house, right? So. From a platform perspective, right, coal regs compliance or, or navigation compliance uh, from a shipbuilding side is really hugely important, right? And it's the rules of the road associated with navigation. Um, a lot of the same principles, right, proving that you can do that as a first stepping stone. Then, you know, some of the simpler, less sexy um, applications such as condition-based maintenance, right, where you're assessing what's going on from a hm and &E, uh, sorry, whole mechanical and electrical perspective, sorry, I don't wanna to use too many acronyms here, um, where you understand what's going on, hey, I, I need to flush a valve, I need to turn something on, I need to change a filter, et cetera, to actually be able to uh, do those longer term missions that have specific maintenance requirements associated with them where you previously relied on somebody to do it for you. Now the system is is taking care of those, those uh, opportunities themselves. So growing from a navigation, which is which is in some ways a little bit more rules-based to a conditions-based maintenance where you have a uh, a little bit more complexity to now looking at things like contact event identification, where you have machine learning coming into play, some level of AI uh, also coming into play before you start tackling, for instance, hey, let's weaponize it and let's see where we're headed. So really doing those building block steps before you get to that kind of uh, really challenging, exquisite mission uh, that people aren't ready for yet. And in all of those initial steps, building the trust associated with that, whether that be through modeling and simulation, whether that be through demonstration, whether that be certification of the autonomy of the AIML and really working through those steps uh, alongside the department. So we're all headed the same direction and we've built the confidence in the capabilities. So, uh, I think, Chris, your nirvana of lights turning on, coffee being ready when you wake up in the morning, I think we've, we've heard kind of the, the state of where we are. Um, I guess my question to the panel here, especially the, the people working on the defense side, is do we see any autonomy program in the DoD that's well designed to kind of deliver the iterative solution now, but also the long term kind of continuously updating the, the, the example you brought up of a machine learning model that needs to be updated you know, weekly or monthly based on new inputs, new adversary action, et cetera. Is anything out there well-designed? I, go? W w we're participants in, in many programs and I, I find that the vast majority of them um, are well-structured. Um, just by way of context, so we, we created an AI pilot and we put an AI pilot in a quadcopter to search buildings and clear threats. It's completely autonomous, the communication link goes out it will search a building like this, look for any opening, map it, and try to find people, and then when it thinks it's dumb, it comes back and talks to people. It is extremely sophisticated artificial intelligence, well above and beyond what would go into a Tesla autonomous vehicle in terms of the complexity of the mission being presented to it. So when we think about kind of, th there's this trade-off, I would say, between capability and dependability, or maybe they're not trade-offs, but the more capability you add, the harder it is to make it dependable because the complexity of the system just keeps going up. And so Shield AI's approach has been to climb and conquer the aviation food chain, as we call it. We look for the applications where the capability of an AI pilot is well matched to its dependability. And so when you think about putting in a very capable AI pilot that occasionally makes terrible choices onto an aircraft, you don't want to target the Joint Strike Fighter as the first thing that you do. Right? But you can, you can put it on a quadcopter. And importantly, when you put it on a quadcopter, you're delivering mission value. You're able to iterate very quickly. And, by, and we use the same AI core at Shield AI for work on mid-size aircraft. So we have a plane called the VBAT. It weighs about 125 pounds. It's sweet. It takes off and lands like a, a SpaceX rocket. I love it a lot. And, uh, but it flies around for about 12 hours. But, you know, very different aircraft, but same autonomy core applied to it. 
And then we also do work. We'll, we'll, be, we'll have our first flight in a jet uh, later this year, which I'm also very excited about. I think it'll be the first AI pilot in a proper jet uh, in, in history. And um, we're leveraging the same AI backbone that we use for a tiny quadcopter that we're leveraging for our mid-sized aircraft, now applying it to uh, some of the most capable assets uh, in the DoD. And, and, and what we're doing is we're driving up the dependability of it. We're sort of kind of recognizing that the capability is the first thing to yield. You can show incredible results most of the time and then, you know, really terrible results occasionally. Um, but, you know, finding the applications where failure is okay is something uh, that we focus a lot on and when we think about kind of, you know, simplifying the problem, driving the capability out to the field. I feel, I'll jump in. So I feel like, though, everything you described there is kind of like in-house. You control the full management of the data, the development, the testing. You're fielding a full product. I'm curious, if you, are you seeing that on the, on the DoD side, though, from a program perspective where maybe there's more players than, you know, more performers than just one? We partner with others, so it's not just us, um, especially when you think about large aviation assets. Like, we cannot build them. I, I guess maybe conceptually we could, but you know, others would probably be much better at it. Um, so, so it's essential for us to partner with people that have deep experience in these areas. Um, when I think about the, the, the government side, um, I think th th there has been a long history of trying to open up interfaces in a way that has created some openings for, for companies like ours uh, to come in. I think recently it was announced that the, uh, I forget the name of the Air Force Squadron, but they pushed an operational flight program update uh, for the F-16. And it was done in-house, right, as opposed to having to go through Lockheed Martin as the prime contractor. And, and, and so it seems like a small thing, but the fact that the government was able to update flight software on an F-16 kind of then therefore means that companies like ours can push software onto those aircraft. Of course, kind of in partnership with the, with the prime contractors. Now, we do do a lot in-house, and we vertically integrate a lot, because getting back to my, uh, you know, New England Patriots XFL thing, right, uh, it, it, we get a little bit nervous if we can't control, you know, our destiny. Chris? Yeah, I, I want to hit a, a few things here. Um, I think that there are great examples of how all this technology can be used, and I think that we see a lot of examples of that. And, you know, um, even with our own products, we will, we will, we are part of a mission set where we will be orders and orders and orders of magnitude faster or, uh, than, than how it's currently being done in a, in a particular mission. But I, I took the question a little bit different, which isn't so much just what we're building, it's what's happening in the department. And if, and if I'm looking at the Department of Defense and I'm looking at the broad uh, set of things that are occurring, on one end you've got large programs, right? Now a lot of those have been around for a long time. And, uh, and in some cases, there are companies who are uh, very good at building the big metal thing that you just called out, right? Um, and I think that that's important. Uh, they may not necessarily be great, in all cases, at building software. And, and we work with a number of those companies. Um, they, it isn't necessarily their bread and butter, and it's not that they're a, a bad company. It's just that they grew up building jets or things like that, and I don't know anything about jets. Don't come to me if you want to build a jet. I don't know. Um, but we do know about building software, and, we, and I think that the magic is going to come over time to where you can just name a bunch of very big, incredible outcomes that come from large existing programs in autonomous systems. When you tell those stories, you already know the answer to your question. And I think that I would challenge everybody here to say, well, why did Chris focus at the beginning so much on these big infrastructural pieces that the department has to go? Because there's a roadmap that mirrors how commercial got ahead at actually getting some of these things fielded. Now, it isn't that they can't come to me or they can't come to Shield or L3 to buy solutions and put them together and then try to push them out in their missions. But I think that really what we're looking for here is an incredible story that doesn't exist yet of how one of these systems 
had an incredible impact that would not have been possible without autonomy or artificial intelligence or computer vision. And it's not that the technology made it as much as we couldn't have been able to accomplish those things before and we have a story that we can tell. I don't think that that's there yet. I don't know of that team. I know of lots of different places where individual missions and things like that have, have great uses of, of technologies and commercial technologies that they're bringing in. But the large programs, um, it's just gonna take a little bit of time and it's gonna take a little bit of effort to get there. Um, but somebody asked me the other day, they were like, hey, what's your favorite like big existing AI platform uh, that's you know, it, sort of a, a key part of the DoD? And I, I don't really know. Now, I know the Jake, I know Maven, and I, we know these different groups, and they're all fantastic. Um, but they're also fighting to push those things into the operational mission set. That's really where the, the next big thing will be, where they aren't just in the R&D side. They're not just in the um, how we envision how this might go together, but they're part of a big program. How does a big program that's designed to field big metal things on a block upgrade basis also incorporate like a continuous R&D software cycle that's tied to that? And I, I have not seen that anywhere, but maybe it does exist. But maybe that's what, you know, the example of pushing an update to the F-16. Having a more technical workforce is another piece of it. I didn't cover that. But in many ways, you know, in a previous life before Rebellion, I started a team called Defense Digital Service, originally under Ash Carter. And we just had this idea of let's bring incredibly technical people into the mission of defense. And, and in some ways, I think that that's just as important. And, and that's why I say that the, this, all these things are gonna happen in two different ways. You have to have companies like mine, you have to have companies like Shield. Those all have to exist. But you also are gonna have things that are gonna to start to occur within the department itself. Uh, some of it is foundational, some of it is workforce related. Um, but a technical workforce that knows what a continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline is, wow, that would be amazing, that's awesome, right? You have people who are talking about DevOps and DevSecOps and CICD pipelines, like that's gonna be incredible. But if you don't have those things, eh, it's gonna be really hard. So we've got about two minutes left here. Um, I'll take one from the audience here, it's very quick. We'll, we'll do a round robin. We'll start with you, Apexa. So if you had to give, in this case it's the DOD, but in your case I think maybe just generally, uh, you know, the autonomy development sector, a report card on its autonomous development practices, what would your grade be? Yeah, I think there is a whole spectrum to that in terms of even uh, uh, in the commercial sector. Uh, I think uh, we, we talked briefly about uh, some of the more traditional perspectives that some of the companies, uh, more established companies have. But I, the way I see it is there is a whole spectrum. Uh, I think we talked uh, a lot about uh, some of the references to Tesla. I think um, uh, from a more technology standpoint, um, it's it's a different level of automation. It's it's uh, what we consider ourselves like Adgathic and some of the other companies. That's L4 plus or L5 which is like true autonomy, but no one in the driving seat. Um, if you look at the overall spectrum, there is uh, the whole traditional automotive perspective of approaching uh, system development, uh, validations and deployment. And then you have on the other end where, where companies are essentially releasing these alpha and beta versions of this, these uh, highly complicated systems out there on the public road for untrained customers to test out. So I think there is uh, a bit of like, uh, it, it's skewed in terms of the the way uh, different companies are approaching it, but I think um, there are certain uh, very serious players in this market, uh, and uh, it's it's of utmost importance to have those uh, processes and uh, uh, more innovative and evolved processes for actually addressing uh, the application of autonomy uh, in a more incremental approach. Uh, that, that, that's how I see it. And yep. So mixed spectrum here, very rapidly. DOD report card. No excuses. We'll figure it out. <laughs> but A plus F. F. Wow. All right. Yeah, I'll go a little better. I'll, I'll go with a C um, because I think there are, there are a lot of fits and starts, but they are making progress. Okay, Chris. Forty-two. 
but I'm not telling you what that's out of. Out of. Out of 50. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I appreciate your time today. Um, we'll uh, step off here right now. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.